Hey watercolor wizards, Hajra here. Today I'll be answering questions for the starving artist tag and I was tagged by Sade from Sade Saves a Day. And I'm actually reading the introduction for these tag questions the same day that I'm filming an art chat live stream with Steve from Mind of Watercolor. So I really hope you check that out after you watch this video. And I'll be wearing the same stuff cause <laughs> I'm filming it on the same day. As usual, there are awesome info dense art posts and artsy rewards available for my patrons on Patreon. And I'm just using my stupid little MacBook cam. I reserve my nice camera for my art demos, which is lucky for you. So thanks for cracking your brushes here and let the epic art adventures begin. Since I just did the live stream art chat with Steve and Marty, which went really well and it was a lot of fun, so thanks to both of them for having me on, I thought it was a good time to respond to this artist tag too. And while I answer the questions, I'm going to be swatching my new Daniel Smith dot card colors to keep it interesting. And I'm going to go back at the end and discuss the opinions I have about the dot card. So make sure you stick around for that. I've covered a Schminka dot card before and its info and its uses in a separate video, so be sure to check that out too. So just real quick, a dot card is a collection of real sample dabs of watercolor available from a particular brand. It can cover some or all of the colors available from a brand like my Schwinka dot card or these Daniel Smith dot card pages which both have samples of all of the available watercolors from both of these brands. Pigment names and properties are also labeled on a dot card and a card is really useful to help you visually assess and sample the actual color on the card versus a digital or printed pamphlet sample of the colors which can both be somewhat inaccurate visually in comparison to the actual paint sample. And the dot samples are also enough for you to test on your watercolor paper or make a small artwork like an artist trading card or a postcard sized work. So it's a good idea to get one if you are considering getting more colors from a particular brand or if you're just interested in what kind of color quality a brand has. So I'll just swatch away now as I answer the artist tag questions and I'm gonna come back to discussing how I feel about this dot card at the end. Question number one, what's your favorite experience as an artist? Well, I enjoy being an introvert and having a lot of solitary time and it's simultaneously very meditative and relaxing and thrilling to be in a quiet room by myself and just dip a brush in some water and let all of that creativity and beauty wash over me as I let the colors play on the paper. Physicist Max Planck referred to a conscious and intelligent mind, the force that he felt was the matrix of all matter, and a philosopher might call God our moral compass and also what gives meaning to our existence. And as somebody who has studied science and philosophy and theology, I find all of those meanings resonate with me. And as an artist, I also say that God is what makes art beautiful. We can all agree that the universe is beautiful, filled with stuff that can soothe and thrill you. And you can experience a lot of that while you're exploring art. Question number two, what's your least favorite experience as an artist? Well, being sick often and having to limit my productivity is a roadblock. I have joint hypermobility and that causes a lot of chronic pain and injury that I have to deal with and it limits what I can do, whether it's art or just other things in my daily life. And I also have chronic hives and allergy issues. And anybody who's had chronic hives or bad allergies can tell you that that's a real pain to deal with too. So I really hate the anxiety and being held back that I feel as an artist due to those things. And I don't even even know if that's directly related to the art, just what stands in my way. I think if I was to put aside the, the health issues, then I could say that my least favorite experience is just letting your own stress or anxiety cripple you from producing art. Just be happy with the journey and try to be content with what you can do with the time you have based on whatever limitations or setbacks you're experiencing. Number three, what are your dreams and goals for your art? To satisfy my creative and learning and growth urges, and in an ideal world, share that process and product with other people. If I can sort of semi-conquer some of my health issues, I'd love to share more of my art and do more written and illustrated stories. But on a more transcendent level, what my soul really needs is just to make art and to learn and grow in knowledge. Number four, what's your favorite medium and why? Watercolor, of course, which to me includes conventional transparent watercolor and also opaque watercolor, which is called gouache. And if you're gonna be a real stickler and a killjoy and say that gouache is officially separate, then I'm just gonna ignore you and say, I feel like transparent watercolor and gouache can be covered under the watercolor umbrella. I mean, after all, if you buy a transparent watercolor set, you'll have some pigments in there that are already naturally opaque. And so you already have some gouache in there, whether you know it or not. 
Number five, what inspired you to do art and why do you love it? Well, I've loved picture books, the library, and storytelling from a very early age. I was a really early reader at three and I loved reading Rainbow. My favorite picture books had fantastic illustrations by Beatrix Potter or Rian Portlead or Trina Shirt Hyman, and they transported me away to someplace magical. And I decided all the way back then that I wanted to be a part of that magic, of that art and writing and storytelling. Number six, what's the favorite piece you ever made and why is it special? Well, honestly, it's really hard for me to choose one. I had a hard time choosing my best nine on Instagram. I'd have to say I'm really attached to my miniature watercolor portrait of Elijah for sentimental reasons. If I have to say for last year and narrow it down, it'd have to be my labor-intensive botanical peacock watercolor painting. Number seven, who are your biggest art influences? Well, thematically, that would be the golden age of illustration and fantasy and storybook illustration and also golden age comic books. I had access to a lot of really old books and a lot of really old comic books at the library so I think that's one of the reasons why I like a lot of the art from sort of decades in the past and wasn't exposed to a lot of the modern art till many years later. And I also really love botanical and natural history watercolor illustration for the same reason. I was exposed to scientific illustrations that were done by watercolors in the past at the libraries. Even though I didn't know that that's what it was called, I was really into botanical illustration from a young age. I think that's why my own style is basically an old fantastical storybook meets a botanical watercolor style. It seems like it might be an odd combination, but they really fit in with each other really well. And you can see that fantastical storybook and botanical style in my piece. Pieces. Whether it's the crow and hookah piece or that botanical peacock, which is also sort of botanical and fantasy, or my original Winnie the Pooh painting, which also has a sort of storybook mixed with sort of decorative botanical in there. I think I put it in there even without thinking about it, but I can see it later. And if I have to name names, I'd say my favorite artists are Alphonse Muha and Edmond Duloc and JC Leindecker, all from the Golden Age of Illustration with an Art Nouveau lean. And I also love Frazetta and Kirby and John Romita Sr for my comic book favorites, again from old books I saw. Number eight, what did you learn from being a full-time artist? Well, you don't make sacks of money. Even if you're great at art, your style may not be on trend or you may not be the type of person who can banter and shill your brand comfortably or some other superficial issue that holds you back. So it really is your skill mixed with luck and timing and trends and you can only control and develop the first one, which is your skill. You keep at it because you love it and because it satisfies you and not for money or fame. I love art so much that that's exactly what I want to do. What do your family and friends think about you being an artist? My parents love that I'm creative, but they pushed me into more financially viable fields as I went to college. I was told to study a solid, dependable subject or that I wouldn't be financially assisted in college, which is why I studied physics for my college degree and then international history for my master's or graduate school degree. I know my parents, especially my mom, who was the hardballer, were just trying to look out for my financial security. And to their credit, I did get a job teaching at a university fresh out of grad school at 23 thanks to my physics and history degrees. And also to give them more due credit, I've been able to use my math, science, and historian skills to study art very intensely in an academic matter. But I ended up still coming back to writing and painting with wasted years and student loans in between. I should have just been braver and told my mom I would study art and writing and that it was okay if they didn't help with my tuition. And my parents have mellowed out as they've gotten older and they accept now that art is not just a hobby for me, it's my life. More reason again that I should have just done what my heart told me to earlier and they would have just caught up like they have now. Number 10, was becoming an artist your childhood dream? If not, what is? Yep, my earliest desires when I was just three and reading a book or watching Reading Rainbow was that I loved art and writing and I wanted that to be my world. Number 11, what advice can you give to people who want to be more creative or artistic? Have fun and let it be soothing, which I totally need personally as escapism from stress, anxiety, and depression in the real world, but don't discard or underplay the learning, the growth, and all that knowledge that awaits you as an artist. Strive to discover and grow as an artist your whole life. It will be so fulfilling to your brain and heart and not just an entertaining diversion. Number 12. Were you supported to pursue art as a child? Well, I was supported to be creative in many ways, to write fiction and prose and poetry, to draw and paint, to embroider and sew clothes I designed, to make jewelry, and my parents even let me paint furniture and walls and buy and read all the books I wanted. All of this my wonderful parents allowed, and it let my creative side really flourish. When it came to college time, they did want me to study something more serious and dependable, and that threw me off for some years, but I have to give credit and say that they loved all the creative stuff I did and fed my creative hobbies from a young age. Number 13. 
Do you make money off your art? Yeah, I do. I sell originals and also prints and such. I do some picture book commissions when I have the time and health capacity. And more recently, I've joined Patreon so I can use that to help keep my YouTube channel and videos going. At this point, the living I make off of it is part time, but hopefully that can grow. Number 14, what do you want to improve on aspire to be with your future art? Well, just to never stop growing and learning and never losing that feeling of wonder and marvel at the colors and forms. There's no end to that. So no one ever reaches the end. There's always more to learn and enjoy. Number 15, what feelings do you try to express in your art? Well, for me, it has to be a fantastical storybook wonder and a beauty in botanical or decorative forms and figures. What I try to express is beauty and escapism, fantasy, wonder, and storytelling. And that's why I guess my original painting style is a fantasy storybook type of illustration mixed with botanical watercolor illustration. Number 16, what is your favorite thing to paint and why? Well, I love painting beautiful figures, whether it's a graceful human figure or a majestic animal or just a beautiful flower of some sort. And then I like to make them more lovely with emotive color and decorative embellishments. And I do end up stressing beauty and decor over action or narrative in my pieces. I skew heavily towards embellished beautiful pieces. And that's why I end up with a Pooh Bear with all those decorated honey pots, or a peacock made out of flowers, or a goat with candy striped horns. Number 17, what's the strangest thing you've painted? Well, you might think I'd choose my winged bunny, or the crow smoking a hookah, or one of my owl trick-or-treaters, but actually that fantastical stuff feels so normal to me. What's really strange for me was when I did an ink illustration for a publisher. It was part of several ink illustrations they had me do for a story. Urban and contemporary and boring for me, and that's what made it strange. And one of the illustrations was a close-up of a mother's hands pulling a check out of a pile of Monopoly cards. So contemporary and everyday, it feels really strange to me. Number 18, have you ever been hung up after you started a commission and how did you handle it? Well, that story for that publisher I was just discussing is my biggest example of that. And I just had to grip my teeth and get through them. Whereas I'm sure somebody else would have said, hey, this is exactly my thing. For me, it was like, this is totally not my thing. So I made them more fun by doing some cool runny ink work to liven up the visuals. And luckily they went for most of them. They did have me remove some of my decorative background elements for two of the pieces and since they were paying me I made them happy and let them have the more boring versions but yeah I was stuck for a while. Number 19. Do you admit that paint smells good? Well my paints are watercolor gouache and some ink so they don't smell much at all thankfully. If they did I couldn't use them. I don't use oils or most acrylics or most makeup due to my allergic reactions to chemicals and smells or just being in contact with harsh stuff. I do remember my dad got some permanent markers from Costco when we were kids and they weren't meant to be used by kids at all but no one checked and both me and my brother ended up using them on several posters for school and I think we were like in early middle school and both of us had no idea why we felt so good and we were just leaning into the paper sniffing those stupid markers as we colored for hours and I think we were drawing like comic book characters and then of course later we felt so crummy and my mom saw the toxic signs on the marker barrels and she got really upset. Okay, let me take a bit of time to discuss the Daniel Smith dot card I've been swatching. It's not a one piece unfolding card like the Schmincke dot card I have. It's actually four separate sheets, which is already a knock against it for me. You know, it's gonna be liable to separate and mix up with other pages in a drawer someplace. It's still a good reference for samples of all the actual colors that Daniel Smith is selling, and that'll really help you understand what you wanna buy or abstain from buying based on the colors you have and colors you can sort of try to closely mix or colors where you don't like certain color properties. There are 238 colors on the Daniel Smith dot card versus 140 colors on the Schmincke dot card. And I love colors, so the selection initially made me feel giddy, but when I started to swatch and compare them, that sort of subsided a bit. A little bit of an overwhelming feeling from having so many colors, but also if you actually count the number of colors and say there's 98 more Daniel Smith colors, and of these, 41 colors are metallic or iridescent colors, and 32 are Prima Tech colors made out of semi-precious pigments, and a few are pastel tints like wisteria and lavender, and another dozen or so are quinacridone hues that Schmincke doesn't offer but can probably be closely mixed. I'm not a huge fan of needing so many additional glimmery colors, and from what I saw on the dot card, I feel like the Primatech colors are overhyped. They're really rather dull, a lot of them. So I ended up not being so impressed with all the additional colors here, given that all the additional ones were mostly metallic, iridescent, or the Primatech colors. The Schmincke card also had labels for light fastness 
staining, transparency, opacity, and granulation that I liked better. The very symbols just stood apart better. On the Daniel Smith dot card, the numbers for light fastness and staining were hard to tell apart at a quick glance. On the Schmincke card, the earth colors were also totally separate from spectral colors, but on the Daniel Smith dot card, there is a brown and neutral earth color section at the end before we get to the metallic colors, but some colors that are typically earth colors and lots of other brands, like Naples Yellow, Terra Verde, Rare Green Earth, and a few others, appear among the spectral colors, which is a little bit confusing for me. I mean, I know what they are, but it's just poorly organized. I also noticed that while opaques and semi-opaque color samples were high pigment saturation and soft and easy to wet on the Daniel Smith samples, many of the transparent color dots by Daniel Smith, as well as the Primatech color dots, were kind of hard to wet for color release, and the color was pale and washed out when it did release. On the other hand, for Schmincke, all the dot card colors, and also all the Schmincke and Snellier watercolor pans I own, are uniformly soft and creamy and easy to wet for color release, and super densely pigmented. Even the transparent colors are nice and vibrant and intense. And I saw that this is not always the case for the Daniel Smith colors, at least on my dot card, and you're free to buy and like what you want. This is just my experience here from this dot card. And the metallic and iridescent colors were very pretty and magical too, but some of them were also hard to wet for color release, and some of the metallic colors were also a little bit too diluted for my taste. But I'm sure the metallic and glimmery colors will pop more on black paper, which is typically how metallic colors work anyway. I also noted that some of the Primatech colors had an iridescent metallic sheen to them, but they were tucked away among the spectral colors again, and not with the metallic and iridescent colors. Again, it's not the clearest arrangement. It feels unorganized in some ways, and I guess that's one of the pitfalls of having so many colors. All in all, I'm glad to have the Daniel Smith dot card as a color reference to compare colors I already have. It's actually been really useful to help me understand that I'm not going to want to buy certain colors and also that I'm just going to try to closely mix other colors that I see here. I do prefer the Schmincke dot card for its, for its efficient selection, more lucid pigment property labels, and the uniformly soft, dense, and saturated colors on there. So make sure you check out my Schmincke dot card swatches and review and explanation in my separate video for that. And so I left off answering question number 20 till now, and that's because I wanted to end with it. And it's, what would you tell your younger self? Well, I would tell me, stop stressing. You'll give yourself health and anxiety issues. Nothing you worry about so much is really worth it later on. I would tell my current self that too. Basically, it's a good idea to have faith in the ultimate reality of the greatest good. Let stress and anxiety go and follow a path of decency, knowledge, beauty, and creativity. Well, wizards, I hope you enjoyed my answers. And I can't think of anybody specific to tag right now, so I just invite everybody who's watching to answer any of the questions they want in the comments below. Thanks for parking your brushes here. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and check out my website links and Patreon pages to support my art channel below. And until next time, wishing you all epic art adventures.